morning, church. Today's Bible reading is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 15 and Luke chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, verses 10 to 11. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. Verses 24 to 35. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours, who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me, that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now let's turn to Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected men. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is God's word. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Auntie Hewiti, for reading God's words. Uh, well, as uh, we mentioned just now, today we attempt to give some answers to these two questions. Does God change His mind? And does prayer change God's mind? Well, I guess I don't have to convince you to pay close attention to the sermon because this topic was chosen by you. Um, a few weeks ago, it came up on top during the live voting in the morning and evening services. So... Therefore, we pastors, we have to do this. We cannot change our mind. Okay, anyway. Um, so these questions are crucial because they are about the one person in whom we should put our complete trust. If God is an unstable God who changes mind, who is wishy-washy, who says one thing and does the ex- exactly the opposite, then we cannot trust this God. Then, well, it's best to look for someone else or something else to put your hope in. On the other hand, if God is rigid, is fixed in everything He does, should we even bother praying to Him? Does He listen at all uh, what we ask 
Him. So the answers to these two questions determine whether or not we should trust God and how we should relate to Him as well. Um, just a, 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 a simple warning, I guess the sermon today may sound a little bit technical because of the nature of the questions, but I hope that it doesn't sound too much like a lecture. So please bear with me. Uh, let's pray and ask God to help us. Let's pray. Father, we, the reason we can pray and ask because we trust that you listen to our prayer. And I pray, Lord, that as, we, as I preach, as I uh, talk, we pray, Lord, that you will give clarity and illuminate my heart, illuminate our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that the things that are helpful, you impress into our mind, to our heart. But the things that are not helpful, perhaps, Lord, we pray that you will get rid of them from our mind so that we come out from t- uh, today's service trusting you more, loving you more, and having more confidence in praying to you every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, firstly, does God change mine? Does God change His mind? Well, the Bible clearly says that God doesn't change. Like He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in terms of His plan, uh, many passages in the Bible say that say that God doesn't change his mind. For example, in the passage that was read just now, uh, Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel, which is God, will not lie or have regret. For he is not a man that he should have regret. Now the word regret here is the Hebrew word naham, uh, it, it can mean quite a number of things, interestingly, it, depending on the context. It can mean regret, it can mean to change one's mind, it can mean be sorry, be grieved, or it can also mean be comforted or to console oneself. So it does mean quite a number of things. My son asked me the other day, Dad, how do you say care in Indonesia? I was, I was scratching my head. I said, what's the context? Give me the full sentence. And he said, oh, how do you say, I don't care in Indonesia? Oh, that's totally different. I see. Then I told him the translation. Because I care about you, I care for you, child care, and I don't care. You use different Indonesian translations for each of them. Um, So in this verse, I believe Samuel quoted from Numbers 23, verse 90 to 20. He says, Uh, In Numbers 23 says, God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Behold, I received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot revoke it. So the word naham here is translated as change his mind, because that is the context. It rightly fits the context. Therefore, I believe in 1 Samuel 15, Uh, it can be more appropriately translated this way. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Because if you are familiar with the story, uh, God rejected or God appointed Saul as king first, but Saul disobeyed God. So therefore, and God had already said that if you disobey, I will take the kingdom from you. And because Saul disobeyed, God decided to take the kingdom from Saul and give it to David. So when God has decreed something, his decision is final. There is no way man can thwart or oppose his decree. For example, in Malachi, we also read, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. In this context, God will not let Israel be consumed, be totally destroyed because God has made his covenant with Jacob and he will uphold his promise. God does not change. And also in the New New Testament, in the book of James, we read this as well. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Now, the literal translation is is this, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. This is where we get the first stanza of 
Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion. They fail not as thou hast been. Thou forever wilt be. It affirms that God doesn't change in his character. His faithfulness, his compassion, all who he is, God doesn't change. So when it comes to God's character for who, When it comes to who God is, when it comes to His decree and His overall purpose, God does not change His mind. However, in the same chapter, in the same passage that was read just now, we also read this. The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and he has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and he cried to the Lord all night. The same, th- the same way in verse 34 to 35, it says Samuel went to Ramah and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah. They went home to their own houses. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. So does God have regret? Does it mean that God made a mistake? Well, again, this is the same Hebrew word, naham, right? And looking at the context, again, like I mentioned just now, it can mean a lot of things. And looking at the context, I believe it is more appropriate to translate it as be sorry. But when, because what Saul, has, what Saul had done caused God to be sorrowful. And this is similar to Genesis 6, verse 5 to 6. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was, that the wickedness of, the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made men on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Now, I was born in Samarinda, a small town in Kalimantan. So that's Kalimantan, that is Samarinda. Uh, my parents sent me whew, to Surabaya for high school, because there are better high schools in Surabaya. And thank God he did, because that's where I met my wife. Woo, anyway. Um, and for the first year there, for the first year in Surabaya, I spent too much time with one particular friend. I went over to his house almost every day, watching movies, playing games, eating nice food. And the news, unfortunately, traveled to my dad. And he called me on the phone one day. Yes, it was a long distance landline phone call. You know, there was a time when calling someone on the phone cost so much money. And there was a time when you had to stay near the kitchen until your phone conversation was over and the whole family heard your conversation. And while you talk, you're busy untangling the cord, right? So you might think, what what do you mean by untangling the cord? You're missing out if you don't know. Anyway, um, (laughs) anyway. While I was talking to my dad, I could sense that he was really, really upset. Now, he wasn't, he he did not raise his voice. My dad rarely, almost never raised his voice. He told me, if you keep going to his place and play, I will fly you back to Samarinda. Now, did my dad make a mistake sending me to Surabaya for high school? I don't think so. Had he had a chance to redo it, would he still have sent me there? I believe he still would. He is a good dad. He cared for my education. So I believe he still would. He did not make a mistake. The problem was not him or his choice. The problem was me. I decided to misuse that opportunity, misuse the gift that my dad gave me. And many of you here, your parents sent you to Melbourne to study. And how you use that gift is up to you. I don't think your, dad made, your parents made a mistake because they cared for you. They want the best for you. And that's what I did. And that caused him sorrow. That made him upset. So when God appointed Saul as king, he didn't make a mistake. God had a bigger purpose in mind. And similarly, he did not make a mistake when he created human beings. But it does mean that human beings in Genesis 6 and King Saul in 1 Samuel have, grieven, have, have given God grief and sorrow because instead of following and obeying God, they decided to go against God. So having said that, 
Having said that, therefore, the word Nahamde, it should be translated as grieved, be sorrowful. But at the same time, there are passages where the word Naham is rightly translated as God changing his mind. For example, in Jonah chapter 3, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So here, God did change his mind per se. Similarly, in Je Jeremiah 26, verse 2 to 3, he says, Thus says the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah that, came, that come to worship in the house of the Lord. All the words that I command you to speak to them and do not hold back a word. It may be that they will listen and everyone turn from his evil way that I may relent of the disaster that I intend to do to them because of their evil deeds. So here it says that God could relent. Yes, God could relent, but you see that He did so, God relented, not because He is this moody, unpredictable God. No, He simply responded to the action of man based on His predetermined condition. If you do A, then God will do B. If you don't do A, then don't blame God if you will not do B. And since they do A, so God does B. So here God is not... Hopefully that makes sense. So here, God is not indecisive. He basically said that if you do this, this is what I will do. So he communicated with his people, his condition, his covenant, his promises, and then he responded to their actions and to their prayers. Which now leads us to the next question. So does, God, does prayer change God's mind? Well, in the biggest scheme of things, there are things that God has decreed and they will happen no matter what. He chose Abraham, he promised to bless the nations through him and through his descendants, and it will happen no matter what. God says that at the, in the end, Satan will be destroyed and it will happen no matter what. And we thank God for those things. However, in our everyday life, in small details of our lives, God genuinely response to our prayers. Our prayer, our prayers do make a difference, especially if our prayer is in line with His bigger purpose and bigger promise. In Exodus chapter 32, for example, when God wanted to destroy His people because they worshiped the golden calf, Moses pleaded with God. Moses appealed to God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and because of this, God responded to Moses' prayer and he relented from destroying his people. And that's why in Luke chapter 18, Jesus taught his disciples to persevere in prayer. If prayer does not make any difference whatsoever, if prayer doesn't change things, if God doesn't listen to prayer, why would Jesus teach his disciples to pray? And verse 1 clearly says, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Some parables, you have to interpret what is the purpose of the parable. But here, it's clearly said that this parable is for this purpose. You ought to always to pray and not lose heart. And in the parable, an unrighteous judge, a bad judge, a corrupt judge who cares only about himself, he keeps refusing to grant this particular widow's request for justice. However, eventually, he gives in to her request, not because the judge is kind, but simply because the widow is relentless. And Jesus says, therefore, in verse 6, And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, And will not God give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Now, a few things must be said here. First, Jesus is not saying that God is an unrighteous judge. That's what he's trying to say. Jesus simply makes a contra contrast here. In other passages, God, uh, Jesus says, God will come like a thief. He's not saying God is a thief, but he simply makes a contrast and analogy. If even a busy judge fulfills a relentless request, moreover, God will do so for the people that he loves. So that's the first one. Secondly, this is not a promise that God will grant every request to his, of His people. 
Not at the last AFL Grand Final, for example, it was either Geelong Cats or the Sydney Swans, right? Barry, yes? Correct. And no matter how hard you pray, it couldn't be both. I'm pretty sure people pray for either one of them, right? And any of you, if any of you watched the movie Bruce Almighty, if you, you, this is an old movie, it was a very good comedy, and it showed a good example of what would happen if God said yes to all prayers. It became chaos, anarchy. The world was just chaotic. So God doesn't promise to grant every request. But this is a promise that God will listen, God will respond, and ultimately He will uphold justice for His people. And thirdly, well, this is an encouragement to persist in prayer. You know, sometimes we pray for something once or twice, and then we stop. Why? Well, perhaps we don't really want the thing that we pray for. Because if it is very dear to us, if you really want it, and if we truly believe that God listens to our prayer, well, we will pray, right? We will continue to pray, and we will pray unceasingly. And because that's what faith is is that's why jesus says in the last verse i tell you he will give justice to them speedily nevertheless when the son of man comes will he find faith on earth jesus equates prayer prayerfulness and faith prayer is the expression of our dependence on god expression of our trust in him when we pray we are saying to god god you are god you are almighty you are in control you are in charge and i'm not Therefore, if you don't act, nothing will get done. And that's faith. And that honors God. That honors God. You know, in, in our house, uh, there are certain house rules uh, that are quite set in stone. For example, uh, no mobile phones during dinner. So no one takes any phone calls during dinner. Uh, we give exceptions if there are calls from Indonesia. It is never an interruption for my kids to say hi to their grandparents. Uh, so if my kids ask, can I check my mobile phones? Can I show you this video? I say, no. I will say no. Uh, anything to do with mobile phones during dinner, I will say no. Or at least most of the time. Don't bother asking me about that because I have made up my mind. Another example, my kids used to ask me for a pet dog. I have made up my mind. No pet in the house. Wait until you have your own house. Then you can get your own dog. So they never ask me. They try for quite a period of time, but now they give up. But there are things that I will answer yes to. There are things that most likely I will say yes to. For example, if they say, Dad, can you buy me a new paint, a new textbook, a new notebook, a new computer mouse, or recently a base amp? If they ask for anything that they need for their school, and if I think it is good for their personal development and I can afford it, I will definitely buy it, okay? Don't abuse it, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> anyway, um, but some things are in the gray area. Some things are in the gray area. For example, if my kids ask, Dad, can we have KFC tonight? Ooh, that's a very difficult question because I know it's not necessarily the healthiest food, but they are after my own heart now, you know? <laughs> so sometimes I say yes, sometimes I say, ask your mom. <laughs> Because I want it, but I don't want to get blamed for it. Anyway, my point, my point is this. As we grew up, right? As we grew up, our relationship with our parents revolved around mom, dad, can I have? And that's okay because we are totally dependent on our parents. And that's how it is. And I encourage my kids to ask for things. I won't necessarily give everything to them, but I don't want them to stop asking for anything because that's how we relate. That's that, that keeps the conversation going, that keeps the communication channel open, and because I want them to know that they can depend on me. I might not give them everything, but I, I want them to know that I care for them, I love them, and they can depend on me. Even with a pet situation, for example, my youngest one dared to plead me, what about a bird? What about a bird? Please, 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 I will look after it. And after months of pleading, we bought her pet birds. But no dog, okay, still. Okay. So similarly, you know, when... God wants us to ask Him for things. Jesus encourages us to keep asking Him through prayer. 
Keep asking. So keep asking, keep expressing your dependence upon God because God is honored when we believe that He can do all things. When we start to say, ah, I don't think God will give me, so therefore I don't bother praying, I don't think that honors God. God is honored when, when we believe that He can do all things. Now, of course, having said that, there are times when we ask God for, for what's very dear to us and we never get the yes from God, and that's very tough. I prayed for my dad's healing from his cancer for years, but God didn't say yes. And early, this, early last year, God took him home. I could never fully understand why he took my dad home so early, but I know that he knows what's best for my dad and what's best for us, and I know what will bring him the most glory. So I choose to trust him. I choose to trust him. And in the Bible, there are plenty of examples of God saying no. Paul, Apostle Paul, for example, pleaded with God to remove the thorn from his flesh, whatever that means. And God said, no, I won't do it. My grace is sufficient for you. And Paul still chose to trust God and use his life for his glory. So sometimes we never know why God says no to our prayer. And it's very tough. No Christian cliche can provide immediate comfort. But ultimately, God knows what's best for us and what's best his, for His overall purpose. Our job is to persist in prayer and to trust Him with the answer and to glorify God with whatever we have been blessed with. And as we continue to trust in him, in him, as we continue to trust Him, I trust that in time, we can see that He's still a good God, He's still a loving God, and He's still a merciful God, even when He said no to us. At the very least, though, as we pray, we learn to align our hearts with God's heart. So, let me bring this to a close. So, does God change His mind? Does prayer change God's mind? Well, firstly, in the grand scheme of things, God is an unchanging God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not lie. He doesn't make mistakes. His purpose and decree do not change because they are reflections of His character. But at the same time, does prayer change God's mind? Well, prayer does change does change things. Prayer does make a difference. Maybe it doesn't change God's overall big purpose, but it changes things. It makes a difference in our everyday life. And we thank God that even though He is an almighty, transcendent God, God is also a God who is very near to us and He initiates covenants. He invites us into a relationship with Him. And just like any relationship, he communicates with us, He lets us in on His sovereign plan, and He genuinely listens to our prayers and responds to our actions and petitions, while at the same time ensuring that His sovereign purpose will still hold. So on one hand, God is unchanging and will do what He says He will do, therefore we can trust Him. On the other hand, God listens to and He answers prayer. Therefore, we can have a real relationship with Him and praise God for who He is. And these two sides of the coin, God's faithfulness and His unchangeableness on one side, and God's responsiveness and God's covenant on the other side, these two sides of the coin reach their highest expression on the cross. If you ever doubt if you ever doubt that whether God is this wishy-washy God, whether God will do what He says He will do, whether God is, an, is, an, is a trustworthy God, friends, look to the cross. God had decreed in the Old Testament that He would bless the nations through the offspring of Abraham, establish His kingdom through the offspring of David. He will send His Messiah who would be a suffering king. And God fulfilled all those promises by sending His own Son to earth to die on the cross for our sins and to save us from death and to grant us eternal life. Even when you are faithless, He remains faithful to you. 
even when we fall into sin again and again, we can always come back to the cross because He has promised if we are in Christ, we can confess our sins and we will be forgiven. And that's His promise. We can trust Him. So if you ever doubt whether you can trust Him or His promises, look to His cross. Look to the cross. At the same time, if you ever doubt whether God cares for you, whether He listens to your prayer, look to the cross as well. Jesus died for you so that all who, and, and to all who believe in Him, He gave us the right to become the children of God. And as children, we have the confidence to go to God with our petitions and prayer because He is our good Father. Romans 8, 31 to 32 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He also not with Him graciously give us all things? So brothers and sisters in Christ, don't move away from the cross. Look to the cross always. Look to Jesus always. And, and if you are not a Christian, friends, maybe it's time for you to look to the cross. You know, before His crucifixion, before He went to the cross, Jesus pleaded with God. He pleaded with God in the Garden of Gethsemane. God, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. He asked God if it was possible for Him to skip crucifixion altogether. But God said no to Jesus. He said no to Jesus so that He could say yes to you when you call on Him. On that cross, Jesus was forsaken so that in Him, you can have relationship with Him. Friends, look to the cross. At the cross, you will find the faithful, unchanging God who keeps His promise, who dares to die for your sins because of His love for you. Even when we are faithless, He remains faithful. We can trust Him. And at the same time, at the cross, you will also find the loving God who wants to have a relationship with you. He is for you. He cares for you, and with Him on your side, you will never walk alone in this life. We praise God for who He is. Let me pray. Father, we thank You so much, Lord, for, for who You are, that you are, you are a God who keeps Your covenant. You are a God who is faithful, unchanging. You keep Your promise. You keep Your promises. We thank God. We thank You, Lord. But at the same time, You are merciful you invite us into relationship with you and we are thankful for that i pray father that in our everyday life as we trust as we grow in our trust in you trust in your word we also grow in our confidence to approach you to come to you every day because you are a good god thank you father in jesus name we pray amen